Uh, so for the information of the policy uh, policy brief, um, you could go to the uh, assignment and exams and click it, and you could see some of the instruction already uh, wrote it. Okay, and if you start it right now, I think this probably is a good timing because you just finished your uh, midterm and then um, the materials that we are going to go over today, um, it's not so theoretical, uh, it's not so theory basis. So, um, well, you know, like in general, I would say probably um, today or by Wednesday to pin down your topics uh, on the policy report would be a good idea. Okay. Sounds good. And if you have any questions regarding to the report, the uh, policy brief, just let me know anytime and we could discuss. Um, maybe I could give you some of the feedback as well. Okay. Thank you. So let's move to the introduction of the macroeconomics. So, hey, that's our first lecture on the international macro. So, uh, if you didn't feel very comfortable on the international trade theory, this might be a good news, you know, like, because this is totally, well, not totally different, but, you know, like, um, I could say that uh, it's a brand new territory for us. Um, because, like I said, uh, international finance it, uh, itself could be a, a semester of uh, long courses uh, during the fall or spring semester. So, first of all, why do we need to um, like shift our attention from the trade to international finance? So you could think about that, um, you know, trade. We have two countries as our sub subject, right? So all the neoclassical models that we discussed in the first part of the lecture focus on two countries, right? Either Ricardian model, Hedge-Chewing model, specific factor model. They focus on two countries. And what is the uh, most important thing that we look at at that time? We look at the trade values, right? Means what? Means the goods, the value of the goods that shift from one country and the value of the goods shift from another country back and forth, right? And something big is missing. Um, what is that? If you buy something from other people, what do you need to um, give up or what do you need to pay? The, the answer is quite obvious, right? So you have to pay the money to the seller of the goods you buy, right? And this is also the case in the international economics. So on the one hand, I say that the trade theory and international finance theory, they probably doesn't, they probably don't look alike. Um, in many sense, but they actually are um, on the flip side of the coin. Um, if you think about that, uh, whenever you uh, involve in a trade transaction, you have to pay the foreign currency, right? Whenever you try to pay the foreign currency, one important factor that you are going to deal with is the exchange rate. That means how much foreign currency um, it's worth, right? For example, if you are in the U.S., you are the you are the um, uh, Apple. You try to sell your iPhone to another company, uh, another country. How do you how do you price your product? You have to take the you have to take the exchange rate into account, right? So that's that's why uh, 
when we discuss the international trade, we need to uh, to have some of the discussion on the exchange foreign exchange foreign exchange rate. So a discussion on the foreign exchange rate is inevitable. So let's move on to the first slide. So international macroeconomics, sometimes this one will be called uh, international finance. Okay. Usually those two are uh, referred to the same thing. So international macroeconomics is devoted to the study of large-scale economic problem in interdependent economies, right? So that means country they buy and they sell with each other to each other. Right? For example, dealing uh, in, get involved in a trade could be could be one characteristic of the interdependent countries. Okay. It is macroeconomics because it focuses on key economic Y variables such as exchange rate, right? And we will talk about this in today's lecture, second, second half of today's lecture. Price level, interest rate, right? The monetary policy in both of the country what will that affect the exchange rate? What about the income, the GDP of the country, the wealth, the GDP of the country, and the current account? Okay, so we will give the definition of the current account today. Okay, and it's international because it has a lot of the countries um, involved in. All right, so what are the main questions that we are uh, trying to understand here. First of all is what is the role of the exchange rate play in the international economics? If the currency depreciation, what will happen to the trade value of this country? If the currency appreciate, what happened will to the country's current account? Okay? And then we try to understand why, what's the incentive for the countries to borrow and lend money um, between each other. <clears throat> Lastly, the government's policy on the foreign exchange rate is something we want to discuss as well. So that's the uh, main structure of the chapter 12, which is the first chapter of the international macroeconomy in Finstra and Taylor. Okay, so why exchange rate is so important, right? Because the world, in the world, we have a lot of money, right? For example, US is called dollar, and China, that's called renminbi. In UK, it's called Pounds. In Argentina, it's called pesos. Right? So in each country, they have their own currency. And this is part of their government um, policy tool as well. So we cannot buy the goods. Uh, from China simply using the dollar that we use in the US, right? So you need to buy and sell the Chinese yuan on the foreign exchange market. Then you could do, you could do, you could export or you can import, you could do the business with the businessman um, in China, okay? Secondly, countries are financially integrated. So countries, they borrow and lend a lot. So sometimes the expenditure of the countries will be larger than the income of the country. 
so that they will have the deficit, so that they have to borrow the money from some of the creditor, some of the creditor country, so they could cover their deficit. So right now you can see uh, one of uh, we will I will show you one of the graph uh, in this slice that the global imbalances means the deficits and the surplus um, of the current accounts in uh, in awards right now are getting wider. Okay, lastly. In this context, economic policy choices are made. Okay, so microeconomics policy usually is a national wise policy. So, as you can see, this part of the course right now, we slightly shift from the micro perspective to the macro perspective. Right? If you think about the models that we talk, talk uh, that we discuss in the trade theory, a lot of time we treat countries as an individual right even in a gravity model if you if you recall even in a gravity model we will select some of the country and select some of the representative consumer in that country right so everything uh, well most of the trade theory are considered to be the micro part in the international economy while now, when uh, when 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 we take a look of the uh, exchange rate, when the when the exchange rate runs the shows right now, the country, the nation's uh, policy becomes more important. You have the monetary policy, you have the physical policy, you have the uh, foreign exchange rate policy, and become the 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 one of the uh, uh, representation of the macroeconomics, right? So if people telling you that macro international economics, they are referred to this part, uh, international macroeconomy or international finance. If people are uh, discuss the uh, micro international economics, they are talking about the trade part, okay? So, foreign exchange, foreign exchange, currency and crisis. So, country have different currency. Therefore, a complete understanding of how a country's ec economics works requires that we study exchange rate. Exchange rate is important, in short. Okay, and definition of the exchange rate is the price of the foreign currency. Like. What is the uh, how much is the euro per dollar? Because the products and investment move across the border, fluctuation in the exchange rate have significant effect on the relative price of home and foreign. Right, so the price the price of the foreign good increase. They could be decompose into two parts, right? If you think about that, the foreign price, right, should be exchange rate times domestic price, right? So if the price, the foreign price increase, it could be this term, increase. And as we will say uh, later on, this means the domestic currency decrease or the price level increase. Right? So exchange rate play, plays an important part. That's it. So um, the goods, the services, and the assets um, um, their price will be affected by the foreign exchange rate. Okay, so this is uh, just give you a picture of how the exchange rates behave, 
right? So exchange rate um, behave differently uh, in a different pairs of the countries. For example, uh, China and U.S. exchange rate are relatively rigid. So they are fixed. They didn't fluctuate a lot. In compared with the U.S. and Europe, you see, so a euro per dollar fluctuate a lot here. So this we call floating, and this we call fix. So this we call fix exchange rate. So we call floating. Right, and this is the data from 2003 to 2016. But I, I guess if you count into the 1998 Asia crisis, the uh, the yuan to a dollar, probably to so RMB to dollar, yuan to dollar probably will fluctuate more. But this graph doesn't show you. Okay, so the chart, those two charts show two key exchange rate from 2003 to 2016. The China US exchange rate varies little and will be considered a fixed exchange rate. While the US Europe exchange rate varies a lot and will be considered a floating exchange rate. And could anybody think about what's the reason behind it? why the U.S. Chinese uh, exchange rate are relatively fixed. Then the U.S. Euro exchange rate. The Central Bank of China intervenes to uh, peg the currency at a fixed exchange rate. Good. So the intervention of the government, right? So the intervention of the government it's the key part. If you're trying to fix the exchange rate, what do you have to do? When your foreign exchange, the supply of the foreign exchange, it's decreasing as the central bank, you need to cover out the decrease of the supply, right? So you will sell some of the, uh, foreign exchange you have right now to make it at the same price, right? If you think about the price, the demand and supply in a, in a foreign exchange market, we actually will talk about this later on. And this, the price of the foreign exchange will be exchange rate, right? And the supply of the foreign exchange coming from where? Coming from, for example, if you are in the US and you are, this is the um, like yuan market, where is the supply of the yuan coming from? Supply of the yuan will coming from the companies that they sell the goods to China. Right, so they collect some of the monies in China. That is the foreign exchange rate, uh, foreign exchange supply. Right, so think about that. If you have more exporting goods, your supply of the yuan is supposed to shift to the right because the supply is increasing because you collect more Chinese yuan back in the U.S. So on the, in the U.S. market, in the U.S. foreign exchange market, supply of the yuan will shift to the right, right? And based on the simple supply and demand theory, what happened? If the supply of the yuan increase, the exchange rate supposed will decrease, right? So if you are the central bank, uh, of the US and you try to pack, you try to fix your exchange rate, what do you have to do? You either shift your demand 
or you just buy more yuan on the market to shift back the supply, right? So I just elaborate a little bit of David's uh, perspective on the on the government's intervention to show you that the Chinese government from this from this uh, graph we could see that we can interpret that the Chinese government they intervene more on the foreign exchange market than the European Central Bank. Okay, so that's the reason behind why some of the country pairs, their exchange rate are relative fixed, and some of the country pairs or region pairs, their ex exchange rates are relatively volatile. If you have the harder market control, your exchange rate will not float a lot. While if you uh, your market, your foreign exchange rate, it's free, relatively free. Like there's no capital control, there's no uh, government's intervention that the exchange rate will float a lot. And that float a lot, it's because the exchange rate, the price of the foreign currency are determined totally by the market. Okay. So we have two kinds of the uh, two groups of the countries. One we call fixed or peg exchange rate, and one we call floating or exchange rate. And as we already see in the previous slides, that eurozone are going to be in this category, and China will be in this category. And I think in the uh, there's one of the diagram here showed you, oh, it's not here. It's in the next one, sorry. So uh, we actually, it's not only this two. So fix and floating, they are like the two polar of the spectrum. So you have the perfect floating and perfect fixed country. And most of the country are in between. And INF, they have the, uh, the uh, category to put the countries in, two dif in different, in different uh, group. And we will see it in the next, next chapter. So why exchange rate will matter, okay? Changing exchange rate can affect the economy in two ways. Changing international relative price of the goods, okay? So if you see this, what will oh, make you think about? Uh, change the relative price of the goods that will change in terms of the trade as well, right? What is the meaning of the terms of the trade? The terms of the trade is the ratio between a basket of the, the, the price level of the exporting goods over the price level of the importing goods, right? So if, not if, you know, like the exchange rate play an important role in a, in a, uh, turns off the trade as well. So one country's goods become more or less expensive relative to another's. Also, changing international relative price of the asset. A fluctuation in wealth can then affect the firms, governments, and individual. For example, you're buying the bonds outside of the United States, so they paid you in a, another currency, and you try to convert it back to the US dollar, of course you will be affected by the exchange rate. Okay, so here are some of the key topics that we will explore in this half of the uh, uh, international economics. How do the uh, changes in exchange rate affect international policy? 
the demand for the goods from different country, right? So you change the diff, you change the if the the exchange rate change, the terms of the trade will change. The terms of the trade will change. Your demand of the import and out uh, export will change. And how do they affect the value of the foreign asset? That's something we are going to take a look. Okay, and another term here we would like to introduce is called the exchange rate crisis. So what exactly is the exchange rate crisis? So exchange rate, it's a relative term, right? So exchange rate, it always have like one, one currency against another currency. So the crisis here means what? Means your, your currency depreciates a lot suddenly. So your money, those countries' money is become valueless. So in an exchange rate crisis, a currency ex experience a sudden and pronounced loss of value against another currency. Following a period in which the exchange rate has been fixed or relatively stable. Okay, so I think the book used, yes, the Argentina's uh, crisis. Right, so suddenly the Argentina's peso uh, depreciates a lot. So I think we do have Argentina here, right? I think. Um, Joaquin, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you might share a little bit of the uh, the uh, uh, currency crisis in Argentina in 2002. Like, do you know? Yeah. Uh, as as far as I remember, I was still living in Argentina, and uh, pretty much everything went from like uh, bad to like worse and worse. The, the currency devaluated a lot. I think it went from one to three uh, in a matter of a week. And then from there it was pretty much nonstop the rest of the years. Uh, right now it's, I think, I believe it's one to 90. Uh, that's the official rate. And then they have like a legal rate, which you actually buy or, or sell coin because you, you can buy a certain amount of like dollars with that. That's actually, I think it's one one dollar to one hundred and sixty pesos. So yeah, it devaluated. I don't know, uh, one hundred and sixty percent in seventeen years, in eighteen years. Very good. Yeah. And can 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 you just give us a a do, do you see any kind of the uh, uh like what happened like on the market? People will rush to the market and buy a lot of the uh, goods or like. Just uh, or get rid of their their holding of the Argentinian pesos at that time and trying to convert their their currency to like the other foreign exchange or not? Uh, yeah. So many people were trying to exchange all their pesos uh, to dollars, and that's why they generated the the black market, uh, which still runs, and the black market you know has a much higher price than the legal market. Um, so yeah, that's what they try to do at the time. Um, a lot of people also lost uh, a lot of money because their accounts were instantly uh, switched from dollars to pesos. So it just lost a lot of their savings. So it, it created a huge crisis, uh, which uh, before that it led to, uh, we had three different presidents in a week. Uh, right. So, right. right. Yeah. So as you could, as you, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, as you can see, if the crisis happened, uh, this is uh, not only a, a foreign exchange exchange crisis, it's also an economic crisis because the price level will, of course, fluctuate a lot as, as well. As we could see, uh, one of the important uh, uh, parity that in the international finance part, purchase po power uh, parity, the so-called PVP, that if one of the countries uh, uh, currency depreciates a lot that will cause the price level in that country increase uh, a lot as well. So what happened if the price level increased a lot in a, in a short period of the time? The, the welfare of the people will decrease, right? Because the wage is the same. So the nominal wage is the same. and yeah, inflation. Very good. Yeah, Boita, thank you. 
because the price increased a lot, so the real goods that you could buy will decrease, right? So the real goods, the number of the goods that you could buy decreased so that the welfare decreased as well. Yeah, so um, hopefully we can get to the chapter of the crisis. You know, that's in, I think it's in chapter 19, but I will try my best if we could. And Zimbabwe, yeah, and Zimbabwe, yeah, and we'll try to uh, get to the topics. So, so exchange rate, it's, 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 of course, it's very important. And um, how to, how to control that and what's the uh, cost to control that? It's always the uh, focus of the mon uh, international monetary policy. And that's the, uh, uh, the major responsibility of uh, central banks in, in every country. Okay, and this will just give you an, uh, a history, like the modern, uh, in the modern times that the, uh, the, the, the crisis happened. So as you can see, the, uh, the, the currency crisis or the exchange rate crisis, it's not very uncommon, right? So starting from the 1989 Asian crisis, a bunch of the, uh, uh, Asian countries like South Korea, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, their currency has been hit hard. So one of the uh, international agency have to get involved to those country and that international agency is the INF, right? One of the neighbor of the uh, GW, right? So they have to uh, help those governments to reconstruct their economic policy and to help their, their uh, to, to help to rebuild the confidence on those currency as well as the, uh, the to, to uh, alleviate the, the consequence of the currency crisis. And start until 2015, those are the uh, currencies crisis. So the blue line here is the average change in previous two years. So the blue line is just the uh, the, the the change in previous year, and the red the red red bar the red bar here is the change in the year of the crisis. So as you can see that if the currency crisis in happened, the change it's always some, you know, it's always like much, much larger than in the average. And usually it's the, the currency depreciate. Okay, so that caused the currency crash. Exchange rate a common event, not a common, right? So an exchange rate crisis is defined here as an event in which a currency lost more than 30% in its value in the US dollar term over one year, okay? So IMF will intervene, uh, World Bank as well. So some of the, uh, the points that we would like to know is why do exchange rate crisis occur? So why? Because the institutional quality, because of the government policy, or there's other like fundamental things that will let that happen. Are they an inevitable consequences of deeper fundamental problem in the economic, or are they avoidable result of the animal spirit, right? Like an irrational force of in the financial market, right? If a lot of people are doing the speculative things, like they they believe that this currency are going to crash in some time of the point, so they will short that currency, right? So it means that they try to buy the contract in the future to sell it. So that will decrease the confidence on that currency, right? So that currency was, we will crash someday. We will see that as well in the, in the later on of the chapter. So why are this crisis so economically and politically costly? what steps might be taken to prevent crisis at what cost, okay. In our department, we actually have one of the professors are specializing in the uh, 
currency crisis. Her name is Garcia Kaminsky. So if you are interested in particularly in this part, you should go and take her courses. Not advertised, but uh, just let you know. Okay, <laughs> not advertised, just let you know. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to the second part of the uh, introduction. So globalization of the finance, it's also the important things why we need to start the uh, international macroeconomics because country borrows and lend to each other a lot. So financial globalization has taken uh, around the world, right? They can hold around the world, starting in an economically advanced country and spreading to many emerging countries. So I think, uh, I think the definition of the advanced and emerging country, we will mention that later on. Will we? Let's see in next chapter. Sorry. Oopsie. Okay, so at the national level, economic measurements such as income, expenditure, deficit, and surplus are important. Uh, barometers of the economic performance. So if your country's income is larger than the expenditure, you're supposed to have the surplus on the current account. And if your income is smaller than the expenditure, then you're supposed to have the deficit. All right? And usually people will prefer to have the surplus than deficit. And that is the uh, like the book said is a barometer means like it's an indicator of the economic performance. So if you have a lot of the deficits, probably it's not a good thing in the long run. And income measure is, is called gross national disposable income. So this one, the acronym will be G N D I. And this is related to GNI, and this is also related to GDP as well. So this is the indicator of the national income. And I think we will talk about this in chapter 16 when we talk about the national account. And the expenditure measure is called a gross national expenditure, right? So how do we measure the uh, deficit or a surplus of the national account. If your income is larger than expenditure, then you should have a current account surplus income so smaller than your national expenditure. current account deficit. Okay, so to combine with the trade, let me ask you, if the country would like to have more income, uh, he should export more or import more. Export, exactly, because you sell your goods to the other country, right? So you can collect the revenue from the other country, right? What about expenditure? Expenditure, national expenditure means the payment of one country to pay to another country, right? So this one is just on the flip side of what? on the import, right? So if you think about this, uh, let me see if I have more space. Uh, so if you think about this, current account, 
country's current account basically means income minus expenditure. Right? And you get the income from the export. And you get the expenditure from import. Right? So what is the current account? If we're using the trade term, what's this? Next word. Right? So if you are, a, if you encounter a trade deficit, that means your export is smaller than import right so that you will have the current account deficit as well and if you are in the trade surplus if you have trade surplus that means your export is larger than import than your current account are supposed to have surplus as well. All right, so now you should be able to have a sense that why the uh, international trade theory is on the flip side of the international macroeconomics or international finance. Right, because you you get the goods, so you pay the money, or you sell the goods, you collect the money. Okay, so this is called the. Uh, uh, give me a second. Let me let me let me reload my iPad. So what this table tells you, the inflation performance and the exchange rate regime. Okay, the table shows the data for the United States from 1990s to 2015, a billions of the US dollar. During this period, in over one year, US expenditure exceeds the income. So that's this year. With the US current account is in deficit. deficit. Okay. So U.S. are uh, encounter in the uh, deficits more, starting from 1990. Okay, and this is just the continuum of the of the uh, of the uh, of the previous table. As you can see now, the the current account deficit uh, is still ongoing, right? So there's no no uh, current account surplus here. So if you recall the trade deficit or like trade surplus of the U.S. modern history, U.S. have more import than the export in modern history, right? So U.S. has the trade deficits as well. So that from the previous derivation I told you, right? So exports and import, the export income and expenditure is the account. They are coincide with each other, right? So if you take a look at the trade deficit data of the U.S., you, you won't feel surprised of the, uh, the current account deficit in the modern history of the U.S. Oh. 
Okay, and the global imbalances, I think I just mentioned that uh, previously, right now it's getting wider. So this is in 2001, this is in 2015. So what is the meaning of the global imbalances getting wider? Getting wider means the countries has the the countries have the uh, current account current account deficit. Uh, their deficits become larger, and the countries have the current account surplus. The surplus become larger as well. So here, let's take a look of the uh, the text together. Um, global imbalances. For more than a decade, the United States current account deficit has accounted for about half of all deficit globally. Okay, major offsetting surplus have been seen in Asia. So China and Japan, they have the current account surplus. And why? Think about that. If you see their trade data, export minus import in China and Japan is supposed to be larger than zero because they export a lot of the goods outside of their country. So their trade, they encounter the trade surplus as well as they encounter the current account surplus. Okay. Okay, so just another turn here. So what's the some of the country called debitors, some of the country called creditors, and this is easy to understand, right? So creditor means that those countries have the current account surplus, and debitors means those countries have the current account uh, deficit, right? So external wealth, total wealth or net wealth is equal to your assets, minus your liability. So asset minus liability will be your net worth. Right, basic account accounting idea. Right, so what's the meaning of the asset? Asset means what others owe you. Liability means what you owe to the others. Right, something you have to pay back and as it means somebody has to pay you. When you run a surplus, you save the money so that you are going to be a creditor, right? So you can lend the money to the other country. When you have a deficit, you borrow the money right, from the other country. Uh, the wealth of your wealth is tend to fail. Okay, from the international perspective, a country's net worth is called its external wealth. So a, not, a country's net, net worth is called its external wealth, and it equals the differences between between its foreign assets and its foreign liability. Right. So foreign asset minus foreign liability it's equal to a country's net worth or the external wealth. Okay, so what distinguish between a creditor country and a debt, debtor country? If they have the positive external wealth, that means the country is a creditor, creditor, creditor nation. That means this country are able to lend the money to the others. Right. On the other hand, if they have the negative external wealth, that makes that country as a debtor. Okay, <clears throat> so this is just the data of the uh, external wealth of the United States, right? So as we could see from the previous table, that the current account deficits are, you know, like there, there, there will always have the current deficit in the modern history of the U.S. So that uh, it won't, we will not be so surprised to see that the U.S. right now are going to be the debtor of the uh, uh, U.S. is a debtor country. 
right? As the uh, another country that's in Argentina. Okay, so um, in 2002, it's the currency crisis uh, happens here, right? And then the INF and the other international agency try to help them so that the current account deficits was in the uh, the worst time in 2002 and then go up like this. Okay, so OLC equal deficit cause external wealth to fall, surplus cause to rise, right? So surplus just like saving and, and and uh, deficits is just like you owe the money to the other country. Okay, and what is the uh, another another terms the uh, terms here? Defaults, a country's risk. So a country they will issue their national bonds, right? So the bonds is like. The, if you buy the bonds from one of the country, the country will guarantee they will give you some of the yields at a, at a certain period of the times. So what's the meaning of the default? The default means that they are not able to pay the yields to the bond holder anymore. Okay, so sovereign governments could predate that without legal penalty or hurt creditors in another way such as by taking away their assets or changing laws or regulations. The differences between the interest paid on a safe US Treasury bond and the interest paid by the bond issued by the nation with greater risk is called country risk. So people assume what? People assume that the Treasury bond issued by the US Treasury it's the safest asset. Like there's zero risk, zero probability for the US Treasury to default. And rest of the countries bounce. Their their yields, <clears throat> their interest pay. The differences between the interest pay uh, interest of the foreign bounce and the interest of the US bounce are called a country's risk. So as you can see, if the countries are in a greater risk, what will happen to their interest on their, their uh, sovereign bond? If you have a greater risk, right? If you have a greater risk to default in the future, so if you are issued of the what will you do? you will try to raise the yields or the interest rate of the bonds to attract more investors, right? Otherwise, people will not take the risk to invest in your bonds, right? So if you have a higher risk to default, your yields, your interest rate is supposed to be higher. And if we assume that the U.S. Treasury bonds are risk, riskless, right? So the difference between the U.S. bounds and the foreign bounds could be an indicator of a country's default risk, right? So if you are invested in some of the national bonds and that country is relatively stable, their interest rate of the national bonds of that country is supposed to close to the US Treasury bonds. So the spread will be very close to zero. But if you are investing in one of the country that have a lot of the, that might have potential risk to, to default, means they probably cannot pay the yields back to the investors in the future, the interest rate are going to be a lot higher than the U.S. Treasury bonds. Right, so here the example is uh, the country, uh, the Poland's uh, national bonds. The country risk is 1.48%. So what does it mean? 
it means the yields of the Poland's bonds, sovereign bonds, is just 1.48% higher than the U.S. Treasury bonds. Right? So this means that the stability of the Polish government is okay. It's Polish government is relatively stable. Whereas um, Turkey here, their country risk is 338 means the bonds issued by the Turkish government, the yields, the interest rate, it's higher to the U.S. Treasury bonds by 3.38 percentage, right? So that means the Turkish uh, default risk is higher. If you your balances have a higher risk to default, you should have like higher interest rate to attract the investors. So higher interest rate means a higher risk, right? And a spread between that country's uh, national balance and the U.S. Treasury balance is called a country risk. So what we assume here, we basically assume that U.S. has zero probability to default. Okay, and last but not least, the government's policies also play an important role in the international economics as well, right? So let's go over it together. Governments actually influence economic outcome in many ways via decision about exchange rates, macroeconomic policy, debt repayment, and so on. To gain a deeper understanding of the global macroeconomy, economists, uh, economists study policies, rules, and norms or regimes in which policy choices are made. At the broadest level, research also focuses on institutions, a term that refers to the overall legal, political, cultural, and social structure that influence uh, economic and political actions. So um, institutional quality of a country actually play an important role in the foreign exchange, in the exchange rate as well. Right? Exchange rate or their sovereign bonds. So the poor country, they might have the worst uh, institutional quality so that their bonds are likely to be default. To be default so that their currency, people are not so willing to hold their currency, so that their exchange rates are usually depreciate. That's just the uh, one of the example. Hmm. Okay, so government can use the uh, capital, uh, capital control as a policy tools, right? And government can also could choose whether they are going to intervene in the foreign exchange market or not. And institutional foundation of the countries, such as the quality of the governments, uh, also will affect the, uh, the uh, global economy. economy. So uh, uh, we have, uh, here we go. We have a different definition of the countries, right? Uh, different. We put the countries in three different uh, groups. So the first group is called advanced country. So what are they? Who are they? Countries with high levels of income per person and that are well integrated into global economy. So OECD, right? OECD countries supposed to be in this category. Emerging market means what? Mainly middle income countries that are growing and becoming more integrated into a global economy. So this are going to be like, this are referred to some of the countries 
moving from developing countries to advanced countries, right? Like China, Taiwan, South Korea. And developing countries, on the other hand, means those countries, mainly low-income countries, that are not yet well integrated into the global economy. So this just uh, the government's policies on the financial openness and financial transactions. If we uh, group the countries into three groups, advanced, emerging, and developing countries. So as you can see, the more advanced countries, their financial openness are at a higher level. Whereas the developed countries, their financial openness are in a lower level. So the restriction on the financial market for the advanced countries are less. People could, could buy the foreign exchange or sell the foreign exchange more easily in the advanced countries. So there is no capital controls in the advanced country, whereas in the uh, less developed country, such as emerging markets and developing countries, uh, the governments put more hands on the, the uh, buying and selling the foreign currency. Okay, and what other uh, what the uh, government could do is to choose whether you are going to intervene the foreign exchange or not intervene the foreign exchange, right? So here, the uh, books just give you idea like how many countries in the world right now they are in the uh, floating exchange rate regimes, and how many countries in the world right now are categorized into the fixed uh, exchange rate regimes. Some groups of the country have sought to simplify their transaction through the adoption of the common currency. So this is the uh, idea of the euro, right? We will try to get to this chapter, okay? And some countries still choose to use their currency. Uh, they have no policy control, as with the recent case of the dollarization, like El Salvador and Ecuador. So those two countries, they don't have their own currency. Instead, their government just asks their people to hold and buy, you know, using the dollar, use US dollar to to buy and sell the goods on the market, right? So basically, they just forfeit their, they just, they, the, the governments in El Salvador and Ecuador just give up the, the monetary policy. They don't have their own currency. Okay. And the quality of the governments, last, lastly, the quality of the governments, uh, what is this? Legal, political, social, cultural, ethnical, and religious structure of the society set, the environment for economic prosperity and stability, or poverty and stability. Better quality institutions are correlated with higher level of income per capita, right? So more developed country more developed country, they usually have higher income per capita. I use the economic terms, that's GDP per capita. Right? Well, in the, uh, another important indicator for the uh, economic performance is the income volatility. Better quality institutions Right, so like the developed country, 
their people are encountered with lower levels of the income volatility. So the income will not fluctuate a lot in the more developed countries. Okay, and this two uh, graph basically just tells you this. Um, so this is the average income per person and on the vertical axis. And the horizontal axis is the institutional quality. So the better is going to be on the uh, right hand side. So as you can see, the, the, the regression uh, line is look like this. That means this variable and this variable, they are positively correlated, right? So if you have the higher institutional quality, like maybe the law enforcement is better, the, uh, the corruption rate is lower in the government, your average income per person will going up. And this is the uh, deviation of the growth rate. So deviation of the growth rate means the fluctuation, right? So deviation, you could see it as a variance of the uh, growth rate of the income. A higher or more advanced country, their people's uh, deviation of the growth rate is smaller. While the poor country with the worst, uh, worst institutional quality, their uh, income are more likely to deviate from a long-term growth rate. Okay. Okay. So conclusion for the uh, introduction part of the international macroeconomics. Let me just go uh, go over uh, this slice, and then we will uh, take a short break, and we'll come back to see the uh, chapter thirteen. Okay. Today's global macroeconomics is increasingly integrated. Therefore, to effectively study macroeconomic outcome, we must understand economic linkage between different countries, their currencies, their trade, and their capital flows. So we basically already done this part. Now we are going to look at this part and this part. Only then we begin to understand some of the important economic phenomena in the world today, such as the fluctuation in the currency, fluctuation of the exchange rate, cause of the currency crisis, what happened of the countries that will cause the currency crisis, determinant of the global imbalances, like how do we use in a national account to capture that, problem of the economic policy making, the cause and consequence of the gap between rich and poor countries. Okay, so I will see you in 10 minutes. That's seven. All right, let's get back. Um, so we are going to discuss the uh, chapter 13 in the uh, Finchard and Taylor. So this chapter's topic is the uh, foreign exchange rates and the foreign exchange rate market. Exchange rates and the foreign exchange rate market. Okay, so basically you need to know what? You need to know how to, what's the meaning of the appreciation of the currency you need to know what's the depreciation of the currency, and you need to know what's the representative of the exchange rate, and you need to know you need to know how to calculate the uh, appreciation rate. Okay, the appreciation rate, appreciation rate of the currency and depreciation rate of the currency. What else? Two of the most Im important parities uh, we are going to cover in this uh, chapter is called covered interest parity. So this is built on the arbitrary condition, arbitrage, sorry, arbitrage condition. And another one is called on 
covers interest parity, those two. That's the uh, important point of this chapter. All right, so let's move on. So exchange rate affect large flow of the international trade, right? So like I said, you know, exchange rate will, will, will affect the foreign price as well. So the goods in the foreign markets will be affected by exchange rate and the price itself, right? So exchange rate fluctuation play an important role in the international trade by influencing the price of the goods in different currencies and also affect the international trade in asset uh, via the price of the stocks, bonds, and other investments. Okay, we will see later on what does it mean. In a foreign exchange, rate, uh, in a foreign exchange market, trillions of the dollars are traded each day, and the economic implication of shifts in the market can be dramatic. Okay, so as I said, most important part, the main role of this chapter is the exchange rate. How does the foreign exchange rate market operate? We will talk about it later. And arbitrary and expectation, those two are the mechanism behind the CIP and UIP. Okay. <clears throat> so what exactly is the exchange rate? An exchange rate is the price of some foreign currency expressed in terms of the home currency. Okay, because an exchange rate is a relative price of two currency, it may be called in either of two ways. So there are two ways to, to show the exchange rate. The number of the home currency, the first one is the number of the home currency unit that can be exchanged for one unit of the currency, foreign currency. So what we usually use that one in the notation representative. For example, as euro, as a foreign currency, dollar is the domestic currency. How much uh, that can be exchanged for? Okay, so the first one, the number of the home currency units that can be exchanged for one unit of the foreign currency. So per foreign currency, how many units of the uh, home currency could be exchanged? Right. On the other hand, what is the uh, another representation? Should be like this: the number of the foreign currency units that can be exchanged for one unit of the home currency. Okay. In this book, it doesn't tell you like which one is which one because it is always very confusing. When I was in the undergrad school, uh, when I was in the uh, college, we call this as the direct exchange rate. And this one's called indirect. Okay, so once again, this is important to specify which country you are in. Just like a trade theory, the subject, the subject like which country from which country's perspective, you need to, uh, you need to pin down first, so that you you understand like which kind of the exchange rate that people are talking about. Otherwise, the the an analyst will be totally opposite, right? Because you see this term, I just be the reciprocal of this term. So if this one increase, this one will decrease. But they actually mean the same thing, right? So you need to figure out like which way people are using in a context first is the number of the currency unit that can be exchanged for one unit of the foreign currency, or is the number of the foreign currency unit that can be exchanged for one unit of the home currency, okay? When we refer to a particular country's exchange rate, we will call it in units of the home currency per unit of the foreign currency. Okay, so this one, should be like this. For example, the US exchange rate with Japan is quoted as US dollar per yen, right? So how many unit of dollar is equal to one 
unit of Japan yen. Right? So these are going to be the representation are going to be like this. Okay. Another example, Denmark's exchange rate with the Eurozone is called as Danish Krone per Euro. Right? Because Eurozone is supposed to be the foreign country for Denmark. Right? So if we know we want to know what's the Denmark's exchange rate with the Eurozone, the foreign currencies unit in a denominator, home countries in the numerator, right? So per euro, how much chrome, Danish chrome, could be exchanged? Like one euro could buy how much Danish chrome? It's the same thing. If we say US exchange rate with Japan, that means we are talking about how much uh, how much US dollar could exchange for one unit of the Japanese yen? Okay, so as you can see, this is just the historical data on the exchange rate. So there's two terms. The exchange rate between US and Europe could be represented by this term. So could be represented by this or could be represented by this. So as you could expect it, what is the relationship between them? They are going to be the reciprocal of each other, right? That means those two, the product of those two, supposed to equal to one. Right? If we go back to the definition, what does this mean? How much dollar is worth of one unit of the euro times how much euros is worth for one dollar? Right. So if you tie those two terms, so for example here it's 1.086 times 0 0.921. They suppose very close to one. They should be the reciprocal of each other. Take a look of the table. Exchange rate quotation. So this table show major exchange rate as they might appear in financial media. Okay, so exchange rate you could see in a newspaper every day. Column one and three show rates on December 31st, 2015. For comparison, column four to six show rate of December uh, 31st, 2014. So four and six. Okay, so four and six are 2014's data. And this one are those two are 2015's data. So column one shows that at the end of the 2015, one US dollar was worth 1.5 Canadian dollar. So where is it? Right? 6.87 Danish Chrome. Okay, and where is it? This one. All right, and 0 0.921 euros. It's this one. And so on. Okay? By the same thing, per, per euro. The euro, the Canada dollar, and the euro's exchange rate, it's here. Danish chrome, and per euro's exchange rate, it's here. And United States, and euro's exchange rate, it's here. So he extract out those numbers, and you figure out those two are just reciprocal for each other. Right? It's just the different representation that we, take, we, we, we talked before. It's either you're using the dollar euro, they're using this. Okay? So they should be reciprocal for each other. But as you can see, the different timing 
a different time, in 2014, in 2015, the exchange rate is different, right? So exchange rate, they, it is a, a fluctuator indicator, right? Uh, we see from a, a previous chapter slice that the Eurozone, the, the Euro to US exchange rates fluctuate more, right? So this just give you another evidence of that, that exchange rates not just fixed at a certain amount of, uh, uh, across the time, it will fluctuate. Depends on which country you are dealing with. Some of the country are relatively stable, some of the country are unstable. Okay, so definition of the appreciation and depreciation, the most important part in this chapter. Okay, what is the meaning of the appreciation of the currency? Appreciation means the value of this currency goes up. Right, remember it's the value, okay? So if one currency buy more of other currency, we say it has experienced an appreciation. So sometimes you reverse another another term. It's called raising values appreciates or strengthen against another currency. Okay, so let me ask you. So previously, in 2015, um, U.S. euro per euro is here to here. Okay, no, it's here. So 2014 is 1.402. 2014, 2015, 1.398. The US dollar depreciate or appreciate uh, from 2014 to 2015. And it's because using the definition we just go go over. So the value of the the dollar so remember that from two thousand fourteen to two thousand fifteen, one Europe could exchange less US dollar. Right, so one euro could exchange less US dollar. That means what? That means euro depreciate. And that means U.S. appreciate, U.S. dollar appreciate. So you see, the way you represent the exchange rate will have the, will, will give you the different representation of the number. From 2014 to 2015, dollar per euro decrease so that U.S. dollar actually appreciate. We will see an example later on. Okay, let's go over let's go over the appreciation's definition one more time. If one currency buy more another currency, okay, this is supposed to be very straightforward. If you could buy more stuff, right? So you would your your value of the currency is supposed to be bigger, right? If you treat the the money as a good. And this goods, if you using this good, you can extract more things. That means the goods value increase, right? And this is the case here. One currency buy more another currency. We say it has experienced an appreciation. On the other hand, if a currency buy less of another currency, we say it has experienced depreciation. So depreciation is equivalent to Falling in value depreciate or weaken against another currency. Let's see the example. Oh, hold on. Okay. 
one more slice. When the U.S. exchange rate, this raises, more dollar are needed to buy one euro. Okay, so here, as you can see, right, so this means more dollar are needed to buy euro, one euro. The price of one euro goes up in dollar terms, and the U.S. dollar experience a depreciation. Okay, so if this term goes up, that means U.S. dollar depreciate, while Euro appreciate. Okay, if this term False. That's just the opposite, right? If the U.S. exchange rate, okay, U.S. exchange rate to the uh, euro falls, fewer dollars are needed to buy one euro. That means the price of one euro goes down in dollar terms, and the U.S. dollar experience an appreciation. Right, so this is the case in 2014 to 2050. So US dollar appreciate and Euro depreciate against US dollar. Okay, important, important. So I think through all the tests, we will use this. So the home country will be US. And foreign country will be another currency. Okay, so we will use this format, like how much dollar you have to pay in exchange for one dollar of the foreign currency. So you see, so this one, feature here it's somewhat, somewhat counterintuitive if this value increase that means US dollar it's depreciate and if this value is decrease then that means US dollar it's appreciate okay let's take a look of the example that will make you uh, I think that will uh, make it more clear. So to determine the size of the appreciation or depreciation, we compute the proportional trace, uh, proportional change as follow. Okay, in 2014, a time t, the dollar value of the euro is this. In 2015, it's this. All right? So how do we calculate all the change? Remember the delta sign, right? The delta sign means the change, right? So what does it mean by the delta sign? It's just the new value minus the old value. So what's the new value here? It's the exchange rate of the US dollar against the Euro in 2015 minus the exchange rate, the US dollar against the Euro in 2014, right? So this one is the old value and this one is the new value. Right, so the change of in dollar value of the euro is this. Right, so it's negative. Okay, and how do we calculate all the percentage change? The percentage change change is equal to uh, new minus old value, minus old value times, ah, I need more space, new minus old, old times 100, right? So what is the uh, new minus old delta? This is the new value, this is the old value, this is equal to 
1.086. This is more, this is equal to 1.211. And you will get the delta is equal to negative 1.125. What is the original value? It's this one, right? So the new minus divided by the old one. So hundred percent. So you will get this negative ten point three two. Okay, but remember this is a negative term. And as we say, if we're using the direct exchange rate format, this value decrease actually represent this appreciate, right? So how do we interpret this negative? This means the US dollar appreciate against the euro by 10.32%. On the other hand, euro depreciate against the US dollar by Right? Okay, so this is somewhat counterintuitive, but you have to uh, accept it right now. If we're using this kind of a format of the exchange rate, so if the value of the exchange rate is decreased, that actually represents the home country's, the home country's uh, currency appreciate. Okay, so that's using uh, from the oops from the euro side uh, the euro side uh, calculation. So in 2014, at time t, the euro value of the dollar was equal to this. So this means what? This means in 2014, one dollar of one U.S. dollar could in exchange the 0 0.826 euro. Okay, 2015, the euro value of the dollar was this. Okay, so we calculate the differences, the change, right? So it's the old one, the new one, minus the old one. That's equal to, right, that's equal to, zero point, Zero nine five. Okay, and a percentage change we divided by the original original value that's equal to zero point eight twenty six. So you will get this number. Right, so euro depreciates against the dollar by this. Hmm. Okay, so I was a little bit, uh, sorry, I, 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 it was a mistake for me to calculate out um, the, from the euro perspective. So follow the, uh, follow the slice here, follow the slice here. Okay. Is there any questions? So here we're using the eurozone from the eurozone. Okay, good. Eurozone perspective. 
right? Right now, home country is Euro, and foreign country is US, right? And previously, previously, previously we use US perspective, home country, it's US, foreign country, it's Europe. Right? So one will uh, appreciate against the other, uh, the foreign currency, and one will depreciate against the foreign currency. Okay, and then we talk about one more thing, it's called effective exchange rate. Take a look. Um, we calculate the multilateral exchange rate changes by aggregating bilateral exchange rate. Okay, aggregating means just, you know, weight average. Using trade weight to construct the average over each currency in a basket. Okay, so if you have like multiple foreign currency in a basket, like you have two trade pa partner, how do you calculate the effective exchange rate? So you times the weight of their trade share, trade share. right? So for example, suppose 40% of the home trade is with country one. Right, so home the trade value exports plus import with country one, the share of the country one's share uh, trade value is forty percent. Country two's value is sixty percent. So of course you will need a country one's currency and you will need a country two's currency, right? And how do you use those two countries' currency to represent a single ex exchange rate? This is what we call effective exchange rate. So basically, you're just using the weight average of the two exchange rates, right? So country one's share of the trade, the proportion of the country one's trade is, is trade, it's 40%. Country two's trade is 60%. So if, if home country's currency appreciates 10% against country one, but depreciates 30% against country two, so what is the total effect of the uh, country, home country's currency? So you need to weight average, weighted average those two, right? So appreciate against country one. That means your exchange rate is minus 10%. And what is the country one's trade share with you? 0.4, right? It's a 40% plus a depreciation against country two is 30% times country two's cherish trade share with the home country. So after the calculation, you will get this one is equal to this, that's 40%. Okay, so what does it mean? It means, overall, okay, if you count all the currency that the home country have right now, the home, home country has right now, the effective exchange rate has depreciated by 40%. Right? Remember, this is a positive. Positive means depreciate. So you can expand this in a multinational setting instead of only three countries. Right? Previously, I have home. I have country one. I have country two as my trade partner. Right, so I need to collect its 
currency, I need to collect its currency as well because I will export my goods to country one and I will export my goods to country two. Right? If now I have multiple trade partner instead of only have two, so I have country three, country four, all the way to country N. How do we calculate this? The effective the change the percentage of change percentage change in effective exchange rate it's equal to this formula the percentage change the percentage change of the exchange rate against the country one times the proportion of the trade of the country one plus the percentage change of the currency against uh, the exchange rate against the country two times the proportion of the country two there's a typo here it's supposed to be two and then to n country n that's it. So it's a weight average. It's a weighted average of the bilateral nominal exchange rate changes. So if I give you an example of uh, home country dealing with one, two, three, four, you need to, uh, you should be able to calculate all the, uh, the percentage change in the effective exchange rate of the home country. It is, is, is there any questions? Okay, good. Just the weighted average. Uh, show the example. Okay. Um, okay, so let me see. Let me see if I could have more example. Okay, let me let me just modify a little bit of this this case. Okay, so home country. Suppose right now I have four. I have four uh, trade partner. Country one. Country two. Country three. In country four, and they all use the different currency. Okay, so they all use the different currency. That means what? That means the home country will have one of the exchange rate against country one's currency, and that means home country will have another exchange rate that's against country two's currency, and so on. Like home country will have the exchange rate against country three's currency. Home country will also have the exchange rate against the uh, country four's currency. So if you think that the home country is the US, this could be China, this could be Japan, this could be Europe, this could be Canada. Okay? And then if China, uh, take 50% of the trade value with the total US trade value. In Japan, it's 10%. Euro is 20%. Canada, it's, uh, it's 20. I want to give a different number. So 50, 10, so 15. Canada is 25. Right, so how do we calculate the percentage change in the effective exchange rate of the US dollar? So if I know the US dollar, with China, the Chinese yen is depreciate by 10%. while 
USB to Japanese yen. So appreciate by 20%. When US dollar to Europe does not change. US dollar to Canada, say so that depreciate by 5%. So that's all the information I have. I have the trade share. And I have the percentage bilateral change, uh, percentage change. in exchange rate, right? Now I have four different pair of the bilateral uh, exchange rate change in percentage. I have US China, I have US Japan, I have US Euro, I have US Canada. And I also know that the share is here. So how do I calculate out the effective exchange rate change. So I using this. I using trade with China divided by all trade times the percentage change change of the US dollar with China. Chinese dollar. Plus trade with Japan plus Trade with Europe plus trade with Canada. Right? So this is the weight. of the each trade partner. And all you need to do is to find out the percentage change in a single bilateral exchange rate. And times is trade share and sum up. That's it. So using, let me copy down the uh, graph. Let me copy down the, the, the figure I have here. So I could pull up the uh, whiteboard. Uh, so US, US, China, Japan, Europe, Canada, this is 50, 10, 50, 25. And then exchange rate changes 10, negative 20, 0, 5. That might be easier. So this is the trade proportion. Measure or proportion. All right, so home country is US. So this is China, Japan, Europe, Canada. All right, and I know this is 50%. This is 10%. 
15%, 25%. And then I know the exchange rate change, bilateral exchange rate change. Percentage, this is equal to 10%. This is equal to negative 20. This is zero. Right, so the in wording explaining US dollar depreciate against Chinese dollar by 10%. This one, US dollar appreciate against Japan, Japanese yen by 20%, right? So this is the same thing. So how do we calculate oh, the effective exchange rate? Change. By using this, times this, All right? So Chinese trade proportion, it's a half of the US total trade, times 10% of the exchange rate decrease of the US dollar against the Chinese uh, yuan, plus 10%, All right? So this is, China trade share this is Japan trade share times this. Right, so US dollar appreciate against the Japanese yen plus 15, zero, times 25. So after you calculate all this, you should be able to figure out what's the percentage change of the effect this, uh, effect, effective exchange rate. Okay? Is that okay? Okay, yeah. So if I give you five, five, five countries, you should be able to figure out as well, right? It's just, this is just the share, this is just the proportion of the trade value, bilateral trade value. And this is the exchange rate change. So, See, so if you have a higher share of the trade value with that particular country, your exchange rates uh, with that particular country plays an important role, like relatively more important role in the effective exchange rate. Right. So for in this in this example, uh, China is the biggest trade partner, so the fluctuation of the exchange rates between US and China will affect the effective uh, exchange rate the most. Let me know if I need to pause or should I move on? Okay, thank you, Mel. What about the others? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so let's go back to
So is this okay for everyone? So exchange rate, effective exchange rate. Okay, so then just uh, once again, I'm telling you that there are two major types of the exchange rate regime. One is fixed and one is flexible, right? So one is like the, the China one, it's like government intervene, interventions a lot. So uh, across a, a period of the time, uh, the uh, exchange rate will be relatively fixed. Uh, whereas the uh, US Euro one, because the market uh, relatively free, so the uh, price, the the exchange rate are basically determined by the foreign exchange rate, uh, foreign exchange market, so that the uh, price fluctuate more. So some of the cases here, so the of country, okay, so this is the figure show that exchange rate of three currency, okay, so what three currency we have, this is Japanese yen, this is uh, British pounds, and this is the Canadian dollar, okay, so US the US dollar is subject to a great deal of the volatility, right? So it's more fluctuates here because it is in the floating regime or free float. Whereas in Indian, Thailand, and South Korean, okay, um, the exchange rate in developing show a wide variety of experience of greater volatility. Pegging is common, but it's punctuated by the periodic crisis. Okay, so you see, so the fluctuation for the Thailand uh, bat in the beginning, it's a lot. But after the Asian crisis in 1998, their government inter intervened more. That's what it means. And South Korea is the same thing. In 1998, South Korea was hit by the uh, Asian financial crisis uh, hard. So that after that, the uh, governments uh, relatively will fix their their exchange rate with the dollar. Whereas in India, it's it looks like the trend it looks upward. There's no like a peg here in India. Okay. And this is the Argentina peso, Colombia peso, Ecuadorian dollar. Okay, so this is called, so India is an example of a middle ground, somewhere between fixed rate and a free float, right? So fixed and float, they are just two polar of the spectrum. So fixed and float. So mo most of the country, they are in between those two regimes. That's called managed float. Okay, and Colombia is an example of the crowing peg. The Colombian peso is allowed to crow gradually, okay, so increase gradually and steadily depreciate at an almost constant rate for several years from 1996 to 2002. The dollarization occurred in Ecuador in 2000, a process, so here dollarization, a process that occurred when a country unilaterally adopt the currency of another country. So after 2000, Ecuador has no its own currency. So the exchange rates, uh, you know, just disappear here. Okay, and this just give you like the uh, category. Uh, this is just the uh, INF classification of the exchange rate regimes, right? So, uh, all, all of the countries in the world, and they are more close to the fixed exchange rate, or they are more close to the floating exchange rate. Let me see if I have a time too. Uh, so.
I think uh, maybe it's about uh, it's a good timing to stop here. So I will pick it up from uh, the foreign exchange rate market. Um, so we will talk about we will briefly review what's the appreciation and the depreciation of the uh, of the currency uh, on Wednesday night. And then we will start from the market for the foreign exchange rate, uh, foreign exchange. And uh, I will tell you what's the uh, covered interest parity and what's the uncovered interest parity uh, on Wednesday night. Okay, so um, uh, I guess it's a good timing to stop here if there's no question. I will post the uh, the homework questions tonight. Uh, I think it probably it's one question on the additional reading and one question on the calculation of the appreciation and depreciation depreciation of the currency. Okay, so if you don't have a question, uh, we will post here, and I will see you on Wednesday night. Thank you. Thank you.